today we'll continue with the um, Taishan Gaiyin Pian, the Taishan Three Ds on Response and Retribution. Today we have up. Uh, last time we actually finished part nine already. Now part ten is uh, yeah. We also did a little bit of here. <clears throat> so as we as we understand, this whole thing is about cause and effect, and there are many kinds of negative karma we have done that might incur um, negative uh, consequences. And this section is about the intent. You know the the you know it's a thought that matters. That's what we say, right? And here the thought does matters, and if it's um, you know, coming out of uh, adversities and unable to uh, divert it wisely, uh, you know those negative in situation that encounter us. If we can't properly uh, manage it, properly convert it to something useful, something positive, or something um, something productive, good, then it will be it will be um, it will become very bad. It will be, um, you know, uh, negative consequences. It will come back to us. So this situation talks about when you have something, you know, you ask, you know, for someone's help and they do not offer that help. Uh, we felt, you know, angry, um, you know, betrayed and, you know, feel like, you know, this person did not. Uh, help me, uh, how is it fair, stuff like that. You have everything, why can't you help me? So uh, the, 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 the bottom line is as long as you're asking for something and those things do not go according to your wishes, give rise to, you know, cursed hate, you know, curse came out of hatred. You know, you curse that person, you, you wish the worst for that person because they can't help you when you ask for it. So this is another very important, uh, very negative transgression. So no matter how small the matter is or how big the matter is, if so long as you ask people, that's what it means. Uh, and if you're not, it doesn't go according to your wishes, they do not fulfill your wishes, you curse them, you hate them. So this is a source of your negative karma. You know, just having that thought itself, that hatred itself, it's, neg it's, it's already creating the negative karma. A person who understands you know, how life is, you know, um, mostly we understand, you know, the you know, cause and effect and how life works. Um, they will not uh, blame anyone else, even though they themselves have fallen into, um, in, you know, they have impoverished and, you know, they got um, difficulties financially or uh, any other aspects in their life. They will not, um, you know, divert that frustration towards others, you know, because they understand why it happens. You know. That's why it's very important to have the um, session like this or the teachings to explain, to continue, you know, um, passing down this understanding, this perspective uh, to us. Because sometimes we cannot see beyond what's in front of us. And immediately we fall into the trap of creating misery, recreating this condition of our miseries again and again, right? It starts from intent. It always starts from intent. You know, it's a thought that counts. It applies both to good and bad situations. And in this situation, bad situations that fall upon us, you know, it can be poverty, it can be, you know, very terrible um, situation in your career, your relationships, your studies or any situations they encounter it has to uh, you know, those examination has to come within ourselves rather than pointing fingers at the outside there are always external factors but you cannot solve the problems by just you know looking outside because the root of matters has to be from inside from our inside ourselves you know from our you know thought speech and action, you know, do I have part in this? Have I taken part in this situation, in, in these circumstances that I'm encountering, All right? And the last thing we want is to create that again. And to create that misery again is to start hating, blaming, because of course you will feel 
shamed, vilified. Mm. You will feel shame. You will feel victimized by other people's conduct, and hence that's where the hate begin. But this thing will not solve problems. Like when the emotions recites, you still have to face the issues, right? You still have to face the circumstances. Mm, yes, there are external factors. There are, you know, people who actually do something bad towards you. But problem, this is a problem. And yes, you have all the remedies, you know, like you know, call the police and trying to find out the evidence of that person's wrongdoing, put it to the justice. But those things are only one part to resolving this kind of conflict you know the other part is you need to let it go you need to understand to let it go you need to understand why couldn't you just pursue and you know in the path of vengeance coward in the name of justice but you might actually pursue vengeance and how many people actually have that ability to see through this what's before them so very hard but it's important because those things do not solve it. All these things is just symptoms. You know, you might catch one bad guy, two bad guys, but this thing will keep happening again, no matter where you are. So we need to think about something beyond what we can see. But something reasonable, but something beyond our ability to see. And that requires someone, you know, some... I think it requires an understanding on how life works, essentially. You know, people who understand how life works, Ming leader and understand the truth of, of life. We understand that everything has everything has a cost behind it. And there's this condition and then hence the effect you're feeling right now. It's not feeling good. It's not something pleasurable. It's not something you should be uh, not sympathized with. I'm not we're not saying that. We're just that if you step away after all that emotion recite, it is what it is. You can sympathize, you can try to alleviate the suffering, that's what you should be doing, but at the same time, you must understand what's the cause. Only then you can truly, you know, not being affected by these issues again, right? Like when next time when it came, it no longer touches you, you're no longer being moved easily. You're getting stronger and stronger. That's more realistic. We, we can't say that it will not happen to you again, because there are many, 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 many things we might have done in the past but, but that we do not know. And the, the effect will come again. Even when you become Buddha, you still need to appear like Buddha himself. He appeared sick. He appeared as, you know, having issues, having troubles with his uh, students as well, right? Devadatta, so many troubles and students. He has almost been assassinated by one of his most rebellious students, Anna Devadatta. And he also has headache when his whole fa clan, his um, clan when he was a layperson, Satya clan was murdered by the by the rival kingdom. Despite his attempt to try, so those are karma. Doesn't matter how high you get, even when you become Buddha, karma will apply. It's just that you don't get affected by it anymore. He does not affect by it anymore. But what? Goes around, comes around. You cannot escape that. It will just, it will, it will be lessened. The impact will be lessened. It might be less painful or less. Maybe from death becomes sick. From sick, heavy sickness becomes light sickness. The, the degree will change according to your merits. Or the other way around, like this kind of situation, you add more to your sickness. Right? So understanding this, who wants them? Who wants to add sickness to themselves? Who wants to add more trouble to themselves? Everyone wants to have a worryless life, right? A life full of joy and happiness, not all this negative stuff. So that's why we need to have this level of this ability, you know, this refreshing state of mind to help ourselves. You know, yes, emotions may come, you might do something at the moment, but try to pull back or try to have a safe place to fall back on. Buddha Dhamma is a safe place to fall back on. All right? And those things will can only be working when you immerse yourself in it. Listen to it. Read the sutra. Understand. There's a whole point of reading sutra is to understand. And then you're willing to chant Amitabha instead of swearing back at them when you encounter this. All right? The, the techniques of doing this is just simpler. Uh, chanting Amitabha. 
but the actual ability to pull out these four words in the face of someone swearing profanities at you and your mother and your entire family, or maybe provoking you, is an entire different matter. Doing this here, where everyone is at peace and happy, is different than doing in front of someone who's provoking you and provoking someone who is dearest to you, or someone who did stuff to you, you know, and and toward things towards you. That's that's practice. It's practice of letting go of our self ego in this um, situation. However. Until we reach there, we need to understand this un uh, karma. We, we also need to protect ourselves in a way. You know, how do you lessen the impact? Of course, you want to lessen the impact. Of course, you want to make it lesser. So, do not allow this hatred to preside in your heart too long. Those are poisons. The longer you keep it, the stronger it gets. The stronger it gets, the easier for you is to fall back into hatred or greed or lust. Or, 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 you know, venge vengeful intent instead of Buddha Dharma. Instead of this clear state of mind, you have a choice. But the choice does not appear e easy to you. At that moment, what will you do immediately? Right? Most people would fall, fall to, you know, pro uh, retaliation, trying to get back at them, trying to hit back and turn and stuff like that. I myself included. I'm not like sage. Same thing. There's a problem because we need to, this is why we are still here instead of a bit ability to bond to pure land because we haven't let go. Right? It's quite contrary to the common sense in a way because these are worldly people, worldly sense. That means they're still stuck here in that mindset. If you want to alleviate the sufferings and improve not just our standard of living, not just our, um, you know, mental health, but also our entire existence, our entire beings. Then we need to learn to, to let go. You can't have you can't have it both ways. You can't have all this worldly stuff, pleasure, the attachment and stuff, while you still want to go, still want to improve your entire being. You need to let, you need to like learn eventually learn. To lessen and lessen that. You need to bawan your function only then you can. You need to let go of all the um, conditions, dramas, good and bad, included good, not just bad stuff, good stuff as well. Good things that happen to you, you know, the couples and your family, your career, your achievements, even in Dharma, like, oh, I can speak so well and I can sing so well. Those things need to be let go. Those things are conditioned. When conditions appear, you do it. Yes, you accumulate merits. Also, let go of the idea of merits. You need to focus only on chanting Amitofo for our case. Obviously, you can just not chanting Amitofo and go into that state, but uh, that's 0.0001%. Most people chant Amitofo. That's, that's how we do it. Only when we get up there, that's another business. That's You can learn all this high level stuff over there is easily. This one, for us, right now, there's only two ways. Amitofo or the world. You can have it both ways. However, this is not ultimatum. Buddhism is not about that. It's just that when at this stage you need to let go of this burden, baggage as much as you can. You can't let go of everything entirely, but slow as much as you can in order to get there. So this includes the burden includes one of those emotions that, you know, comes up when you don't get what you want. Question the question is, is what you want really important? Compared to, you know, able to get out of this condition forever. Get out of this, like I mentioned previous few classes, this, even in the Buddha story, right? This, this world, in its really truest form, is happening because of suffering. There are many kinds of suffering, right? They are not just simple. simply you, you, you don't have money, you're poor, you're, poor, you're hungry, you're... You um, have disabilities, you have issues. There's also the suffering of not fulfilling. Your life is never fulfilling. Or what you want, you don't get. This Chibuta. ku. Right? You, you can't get what you wish for. I barely ku. The people you love leaving you. 
no matter how good the time you could pass together, you, the one day they will leave you. Because this is how it is in this parameter, this condition that we're in. This is the world. And understand this, we understand why Buddha keeps saying emptiness. Right? For us, it's not about don't do anything. Right? When I say let go, when I say choose Amitofo or the other, it's not saying don't do anything. Sit there. You can if you have that fortune to actually only chanting Amitofo and people will help you by, you know, give you food and stuff. There are even in Tainan, there's this level five, you know, Ninfo Tang, where you, Yi Qian, I think, used to be having a place exactly for people who want to do 24 hours, 48 hours non stop. But remember, these things are only when you're really resolute, really sure. Otherwise, a lot of people might actually can't hold it any longer and felt. It's commendable, but also know your limits. All right? So what I'm trying to say is um, this kind of emotions and everything is what bond us to these sufferings, this world of sufferings. And the sufferings we're mentioning is not just purely pain, pain, pain. It's pleasure and what's happening after pleasure. The absence of pleasure becomes pain. Never-ending waves of pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain. It's also a problem. Never ending. Like the, the the dance can never end. It's just tiring as well. It's also another form of pain. Xingku. So, having body is also a form of pain already. So heavy. Weight down my gravity. Anything can kill you. You know? All it takes is something called germs to kill you. You don't need a body. Like in the truest form of your true nature. Why are you tying yourself down to this? Attachments. Attachments. That's why we have a body. That's why it feels so heavy. That's why it feels so drowsy. That's why it feels so every day so drag. Mendoxai in Japanese. Very annoying. Very no heavy. Of course we can change this around. Buddhism is not about pessimism. It's not about sitting there and sitting there and wait to die. It's not, it's not what Amitabha was trying to tell you. It's trying to tell us this is the reality of the world. You can do what you can do in this world. Of course, there's so many things to achieve here. You know, I myself also have ambitions as well. I also want to achieve something. But it does not mean that it, it does not negate the need for us to think about, not think about, to actually prepare ourselves beyond that. You know, no matter how high your achievement is, you only can reach so far before you have to pass away. People might pass down or not pass down this up to the condition of your achievements. So what we need to do right now is think beyond, not, not ignoring, but thinking what you need to think, do well in what you can reach, and then beyond that, what you must do. Having that scope will help you to deal with this kind of negative thinking. Right? Avoid yourself from doing this petty stuff. This one becomes petty to you. Right? Is it the fault of other people when you do not get what you want? Like say you go to interview for 20 jobs. All 20 people rejected you. It feels like crap. You feel like a failure. You have done your best. You consulted your friends. The top of the class. You know, You pay money for the you know, professional resume or CV uh, pr uh, reviewer, they help you to type up a very good looking CV. You still don't get it. Why? Is it the fault of all 20 interviewers? Is it not a time for us to think about maybe I should upskill, maybe I should kind of focus on what I can do now in the meantime, improve myself? improve my outlook on my life, improve my quality. Right? This is something we, can, we have to face right now in, in the real world. So this is how it works. You know, when things not going our way, look in ourselves, like, what kind of habit do I have that might be a hindrance to my success on whatever I'm pursuing? Right? Put it in the terms of cause and effect. What cause do I lack? 
in order to grow into this effect, whatever effect I deem as success. Getting a good job, getting a good partner, spouse, those things need work as well. And nothing comes free. Nothing is cheap. You know, don't be fooled by movies. Those are beautiful stuff, beautiful music, beautiful people, beautiful stories. But those things are not based on real cause and effect. A very good story will always base something on something tangible, like cause and effect, something grounded. As in, it does not just pop up out of nowhere. Maybe if it's a comedy, for the sake of it, it's fine. But a serious long-term drama, I always have that weightiness of the world. When they build the world, they need to think about consequences, think about past, present, future. But maybe even in one life, maybe it becomes an interwoven web of you know, stories. You know, this person did this to the other person, and then the other person will do this back to them in future when it has power, stuff like that. And then this becomes a story that you will keep watching. Like, oh my God, how did he come back? Think about all these heavenly beings looking at us or themselves as well. They were like, oh my God. Yeah, our life is actually more interesting. If you look at that story of many lifetime, I was like, oh my goodness, my own life is actually quite interesting. Give me a very good movie out of it. Part of the movie is this one, you know? So, what's the cause, right? Buddha is teachers, of course. Giving is not easy sometimes, you know, when you're out of energy, out of time, or maybe not out of time, out of willingness, out of, out of your mental, maybe out of your habit, you know, we always have a habit to rest, enjoy, but don't want to work hard, don't want to, I wouldn't say don't want to work hard, if we don't place it right, we just don't want to do anything beyond what we used to, it's just a habit, you know, we always want to go into that comfort routine, so you know, to give, it means you need to let go of your routine, let go of your comfort, Give your time, give your money, give your knowledge. <clears throat> Those things all takes efforts. You don't just sometimes small one like you know just giving a few dollars to the homeless people. That's a good gesture, and then you keep doing it every day. Small stuff accumulate into a very powerful habits. Always take five dollar cash with you when you're out there. When you see anyone, the first person you see, drop the money to them. Don't even think about it. Be thankful that they accept your your money. So because they are the one, if you understand cause and effect, they are the one who help you to gain wealth in a way. In Chinese there are three We're talking about cause and effect, right? We're talking about how do you get what you wish, right? Still relevant to the point. There are three There are three grounds, fertile soil to grow our fortunes. One of the good fortunes including the monitor and the financial fortunes. Uh, but it can go beyond that. We cannot restrict ourselves to so narrow to just money. That's important. Money is important. The world revolves around the money. We understand that. But we also need to think about wisdom, looks, health, you know, also a, 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 a happiness, you know, a more open kind of a attributes. So how do you get all this, right? The basics are, there are three fertile grounds to grow that. Fortune, good fortune. That's what I mean. Number one, your parents or your guardians, people who take care of you, grandparents, parents, even your brother and sister. Some people were taken care of by their own brother and sister if they're in the circumstances uh, where parents are no longer there or not free. People who do good to you when you were young, raise you or when you're in need, they help you. But it was represented by parents. Number one is your parents, people who raise you, teach you, nurture you, take care of you, you know, at the expense of their own youth. They spend their life energy into you. So they are number one, most important route for you to grow your merits. So take good care of them, for they are your roots, basically. You are basically nurturing your future. So this is very important, important to take care of them. Not not just, of course, not purely for calculative version. If you do that, it's not. The whole point is parents, they take care of you, take care of back of them. It is only right. Number two, the, the needies, the people in need. 
poor, poor, impoverished people, homeless people, they are impoverished. Those people who are in need of material assistance, those things within your reach, you can just buy you know, a meal to them, a couple of dollars to them. Those are also very uh, fertile ground for you to grow your merits, good merits. So that's why you can see people who, you know, knows how to um, maintain their wealth and stuff like that. They always learn how to give because you need to give back. You know, you, there's, at some point, there's way too much for you to enjoy by yourself. It's got to, it, it has to go back to where it came, to where it needs, where it was needed the most. Number three. Um, Hui Tian Mai, I don't know how to say it. it's the monks, the Buddhas, you know, the Sanghas, the, the monks, the people who cultivate merits, who spread these words. You know, you offer to these cultivators, you know. Um, in Buddhism, there are four ways to do it medicine, take care of their body so that they can continue to propagate Dharma, um, sleeping, sleeping. Stuff like blankets, you know, sleeping bags, mattress, etc. You have to offer that as well. Number three, food. Food is important. You can offer food. Sushi Gong. This one is in Buddhism. Or uh, the these the um originally Bud monks are not supposed to touch money. All right, they are not supposed to touch money. So. What do they offer then? How do they help the propagation of Dharma? You know, they need to the support. So there are four of them, right? And yeah, food, drink, uh, clothing, yes, clothing, food, medicine, and sleeping needs, you know, all these toiletries and stuff like that. So even nowadays, you, in any Buddhist temple, you can help them by providing this kind of, um, you know, buying a box of, daily needs if there are like monks in there of course in our Sydney NSW we don't always have venerable living there we just accept donation in cash and stuff to build you know schools or to print more books not schools to build the event you know the upkeep you know, rental and stuff like that those things can be helped with cash it's fine usually we have a lay person helping it so I don't want to go too technical on that. What I'm trying to say is all this day-to-day -day stuff is what helps us to get what we want. It won't happen immediately. It has to depend on the conditions. And you know, as long as you're sincere, that means you don't think of anything in return. You know, whatever you actually need will come to you uh, at the right time. So always understand that. Then we no longer have to blame other people or have energy to blame other people because we always try to look in ourselves and say, I need to cultivate better. You know, this is what I'm lacking. So I'm only receiving the consequences of my action. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, I'm being stingy. Now I'm in an impoverished situation. I'm exactly, you know, walking in other people's shoes. Back when I was supposed to be giving, now I, didn't, I didn't give back then. Now I'm at the position of asking for people to help me. Only then we can take this in the right way and improve ourselves. To see another misfortune or suffering, yet dismiss it without sympathy as the deserved result of the sin. Engage in stride and Freud, you know. This first two years, the first one is seeing people's misfortune or suffering. Mm. Mm. See? Yes, we know cause and effect. And then if we understand this as like, oh yeah, because you, you create bad cause, so now you're suffering from the consequences. So, you know, so if you're right, that's not the right way to do it, mate. Uh, yes, we understand the truth, but the tone and the intention is to make us aware of it so that we can improve, we can avoid or lessen that impact, not to throw, put oil to fire, you know, not, not adding oil to fire, not adding to the flames. That's not the right way to do it. That's another form of, you know, negative action. You know, transgression. So that that adds to your negative karma. Why will you, what will you feel if you're in a situation where you have a fallout with your you know, family or your um, 
job or stuff like that and then someone just walk up to you and say yeah, this is your bad karma man so yeah so if you're right of course you will feel like what you feel ouch of course everyone is like, I, I have faith that people understand you know eventually that they have a role in their own path misfortunes everyone has that level of awareness it's just how much they're willing to admit it remember there's something called face in the society all right ourselves we also have a face you know we'll put up a face when we encounter other people even among families sometimes so what we need to understand is to sympathize all right it's not even just face it's just simply you know understand where they are you know yes you might know all this big theory and big stuff if you don't even have that ability to sympathize understanding how do you how do you help them how are they willing to accept your help and of course we need to reflect on ourselves am i the right person in the right position to help him am i the right kind of person to help this person is my relationship with that person correct well positioned for me to say this kind of thing to them if not rather find someone who are truly caring about them and encourage that person to help them like you're just simply an acquaintance and you saw someone who is doing something that will lead to their own downfall and now they have encountered these issues so what do you do you can't just walk up in front of them and say this is bad karma bro you can eventually hint it depends on how old they are you can hint and hint it at them you can, you can you can try to tell them and this might be you know maybe we can look at this the other way you know you being tactful is important all right there are times where you to go straight all out they are very useful right some people they, they they can take it all out in your face but you need to know that person though if you don't know that person right you can help them right even you speak the truth you know they might be rejecting it still i have faith in people understanding their own role in their own circumstances we always have that a uh, sense of awareness you just need to find out right person or right word to, to take it out right so remember this is this is more like a you know lacking compassion lacking empathy not for the best intention of that person coming is back in the word is the thought that matters is thought that counts Schreiden for it is just German word for join witnessing people's misfortune. It was loaned straight into English. It's very common, apparently. So, Shrieden for it is just in Chinese, Sing Jai Le Huo. Basically, join misfortune. You just like to see the whole world burn. Um, put in comedy is funny, but you know, in, in real tragedy, it's terrible. Like, say someone having mental health issues. You know, committing suicide or having family that, you know, gone through terrible stuff, traumas, like veterans have traumas. And then, or, you know, maybe young ones losing their parents at a very early age in the car accidents. Those things are terrible. And uh, as a, you know, as a person, or not just person, even animals can have that sense of empathy. We should, we should stand with them. Let them know that they are not alone. No matter who you are, strangers as well can have a gesture of kindness. They're just saying, how are you? Are you okay? Yeah, I, have a, I have a colleague that came to me and said, thank you for asking me, are you okay? It's just a simple gesture. Uh, I didn't do anything. I just like, okay, maybe you know the boss is being very strict, saying something. And I just walk up to the, are you alright? And she's like, okay, I'm fine. That means that this person is not alone. Let's put aside like, whether this person is actually at fault or not. Just help them get through that emotion. Like I say, that emotion, getting through that, is a huge journey by itself. And that's why we are entangled in this world. So when I say that, I don't say that we should dismiss it like a robot and like you say, uh, you know, hold it and thou. That's a very wrong attitude, especially for anyone, not just Buddhism, every religion. They should not have a hold it and thou attitude. Instead, it should be like Mother Teresa, like Jesus, like Buddha, you know. That's why they are so good. They are not holy than thou. They're together with the people. Eat together, sleep 
in the same congregations, you know. Uh, even Buddha washed the feet of the blind, disabled monk. As a Buddha, as a teacher, he just washed it like a normal person. He sewed his broken clothes, you know. What, what does it show? It shows that everyone's equal, right, in this journey. Mother Teresa, you know, helping those decrepit, poor, ill children or ill patients, hugging them when even though back then AIDS were known as, you know, transmission. They thought there's a, you know, stigma where, you know, you touch the AIDS, people who have AIDS, you know, uh, sexually transmitted disease. You touch them, you immediately got it. Uh, later, it was proven that it's a blood transfusion. You know, when you have open wound, they have open wound. Only then you can transfuse the disease. But Mother Teresa did not have that knowledge back then. She just do it out of the compassion. Just hug these eight people to tell them you're all right. I don't. I have no fear about that. Where did that come from? Strong faith brings strong compassion. Strong compassion brings strong faith. Same as Jesus, he helped the um, also the same thing as Buddha. He helped the blind people. He helped the people who are, you know, unable to walk or in the in the terrible situation to tell them they are all right. So what this shows us is we need to have compassion, no matter how big your wisdom is. The it would in in fact, the most compassionate people, the wisest people, are the most compassionate people. Because they understand. Uh, Melinda? Yes, please. Uh, when you gave the example of Jesus, Jesus uh, cured people with leopard. Yeah, very famous. Yeah. So I remember him just uh, helping, uh, healing people with leopard can walk or other illness that people despise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. He did like, you know, the lap give sight to the blind, touching the lepers, healing the sick. Like no matter what you know, what truth they preach, to be honest, there's only one. But you know, all these high level ideas, right? It doesn't reach to people like that. You can't just sit there and say, oh, yeah, you must believe and all that. Look at what they did to Europe. If they just do it from that high level downwards. Mostly those people uh, either, you know, become too too literal. But look at the founder themselves, how they do it. Or look at one of those better, like more practical, like more the successes of these founders, including Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad. Those people who, who, who actually understand how this thing works is they actually go to the people, they actually live with them, suffer with them, understand where they come from, feel what they come from. And then, of course, not everyone has the ability to give sight to the blind, touching the lepers. I'm sure Buddha has the ability as well, but it's just a matter of does it really help to teach you or does it really work in that society? It just It's just different. But the whole point is you need to be there with them. You need to be there. Eat what they eat. See what they see. You know, only then you can tell them all these big teachings. It goes to Buddha. You can't just teach people to gain full enlightenment when you don't even understand where where is their pain, where is their suffering, right? When you don't even feel their suffering, feel their pain, how can you teach them about, or how do you how can you help them about gaining enlightenment? In Christian context, how do you teach the word of God to them when you don't even understand what their suffering is? Same same thing. No, no matter what religion or what teaching, even the secular ways of you know understanding you know, communism, liberalism, all these ideas and stuff like that. If you don't even touch the grassroots of the people, understand their sufferings. Instead, you go up there and play all these political games, gaining power, murdering 20 million people in the name of some holy ideas. Same thing, isn't it? Can, you can see the similarities. People who detach from what it really means, you know, what the message really means, can do terrible things, worse things, in the name of religion, in the name of some ideologies, no matter who, where, who they are. So compassion is very important. Very, very important. 
without that thing, unable to feel anything, you become a cold, calculating machine, in a sense, aloof, removed. How can you touch the hearts of people and, you know, invoke their inner nature, their inner motivation, their energy to help themselves, to actually motivate themselves to push beyond the limits, right? Those things, those things are born out of love, born out of actual love, actual care, actual patience, being there every time this person throwing a fit, especially people who lost disabilities, you know, disabilities like, like say soldiers, they lost their legs suddenly, they suddenly can't do anything. Can you say that they all like suddenly become very motivated and overcoming like joining Paralympics? They have to go through all that crap. You know, or suddenly they have losing that they need to feel the need to learn how to walk again. You know. And and then they need they sometimes they can't control themselves, they're just being very angry at themselves that they lash out towards their loved ones, their mom, their wives, their children. Just being angry, throwing feet everywhere. And people who take care of them needs to be have a patient of a saint, literally, to bring this person out of that hole. So, misfortune is not it's not funny thing, you know. It can happen to you, to them. Only when we think about, I will fall into that misfortune. Then we will start to, you know, start to, like, be more thoughtful of others. If you can't do anything, in the very least, always maintain good thoughts. Smile to them, no matter how fake the smile is. Like you might be having sh- trouble, crap, hope it happen. But when you look at this person who is actually s- sad, give them a smile. You never know. You might save them from committing the unspeakables. You never know that. Like gestures is important, mate. Gesture. I still need to learn how to do this because this is this is something that I, we have neglected a lot, especially when we're cultivating, right? Like we saw a lot of people who just talk, 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 talk about the sutra, this and that. They were like, "Oh, I'm so, I know all this, I know this theory, I know all this stuff." Then, when you really ask them, like, how long has it been since you last donated to someone who need? How long has it been since you actually say I love you to someone who who really need it? How long has it been since you say, not, not necessarily have to be that, yeah, since you actually do something kind for others? Something simple, something that everyone can touch. Before you go there, I'm not saying that we shouldn't say that. You know, I also like to talk about this, but all I can find is, it's all words. There's no meaning to it. Because I haven't actually do anything that will realize these teachings. All I'm doing is just you know, putting a show, talk on it. Obviously, we all still need to explain and understand the Dharma. Say this is our, you know, we should do that. But we should not forget about the other aspect, which is practice. You know, understanding and practice comes together. When you understand and you practice what you understand, you improve your understanding, you enforce your understanding. Your understanding becomes faith, becomes a strong backbone because it's no longer just Dylan say something like that or I, I think like that. Is this is actually my reality? I'm living in this world. I'm actually experiencing it now. I'm I'm firmly convicted to this because I'm actually experiencing it. And you know, you no longer you have more energy. To be honest, the more you do it. So yeah, Schaden Freud. Funny in a in a comedy, but that's it. That's a limit. Real life, you know, you don't want to be Schaden Freuded. When you're getting a trouble, no one, no one likes a Schadenfreuden. I'm uh, sorry, man. I just like the German word Schadenfreude. But the um, yeah, Freud is happiness. Schaden, I think, something to do with misfortune, happiness, something. Anyway, sorry, sorry, out of topic. Okay, continue. Um, thank you, Melinda. Yeah, thanks for uh, correcting me. He actually go further than that. He, he um, yeah, he heal people. I believe that. I believe that. I mean, did you say that Jesus was uh, a form of a uh, Guanxing Pusa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a monk what? that uh, was in Japan. Have you heard of it? Master Chinko no. went to Japan. Should I tell you? Please, because 
um, uh. because <laughs> I'm I'm willing to learn because uh, Buddhism is fascinating, but I really think all religion stemmed out of Buddhism and and stuff like that. In spirit, yes, yeah, they do. Like they're just not leaving a lot of trace for you to find anyway, because it's not something that we need to worry about, to be honest. But um, like you say, it's just for us to hear, right? So well, Master Ching Kong no, went to well, Japan. Mm. I, sorry, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, nowadays, I, even myself, before I believe Buddhist, I was like, prove it. And a lot of the young kids would say, no, I don't believe it. Well, if you give them history, right, mm. then they will believe it. Without history, you can't do anything. That's right. Because it's becoming a imaginary stuff instead of a real substantial people who actually put an effort in different era for different needs at the time. You know, human needs, human natures, human disasters, human crisis of faith, crisis of, um, you know, wars and stuff like that, in need of that. Also achievements in the history, proven in again and again. It's like science, tested. That is longer than science, thousands of years, tested track records. All right, there are bad apples, of course. There are people who leech off the benefits given by the government towards the religion. You know, like, even back in China, they always have tax benefit in the sense of give you a land tax-free, planting or the crops without paying tax because it's a way the government donate to this cultural, I mean, this teaching, these teachers, these monks, so they can cultivate. And the government themselves cultivate merits on behalf of the people in a sense. But going back to what you want to hear, what we want to hear, Master Shin Kong went to Japan and there was a Japanese, that was back in 2000, early 2000. There's a Japanese monk who never speak a word to anyone else. Do not like to talk to people. As monk mostly would, you know, they would keep to themselves and focus on cultivating Buddha Dhamma. So this is a monk, right, who do not speak to anyone longer than a few sentences in their, I don't know, 20, 30 years of life. I'm approximating here. Please forgive me. I forgot a lot. You can search it online. <clears throat> um, Master Ching Kong went there as a part of a tour, excursion, invited by the monk over there. And he went there and, you know, shared about Pure Land. They're all Pure Land, right? Japanese monk, they are also Pure Land. Mostly Pure Land or Zen, either one from China. So they went there and it's exchanged. So he went, met this monk. This monk, who never speak to anyone more than one or two sentences, suddenly went to him and say, sit down and say, let me tell you, you know, you know, Jesus, he's, he's Kwan Sing Pusa, you know. He just told him that. He never said anything to anyone like that. He never said anything beyond the day-to-day -day practical words, you know. Have you eaten or something like that. I don't know. Basic stuff. But he, when he met Master Ching Kong, he told him that. This is Kwan Sing Pusa. This is Jesus, you know Jesus? Yeah, he's Bodhisattva Avaloe Kidesvara. You know, Bodhisattva Kwan Yin. Bodhisattva who, uh, the Bodhisattva of hearing the sounds of the world, the needs of the world. And Master Ningong said, I believe that, yeah. Because he didn't realize that until the student, after the meeting, came up, came to Master Ching Kong and asked, my teacher never speak to anyone longer than one, two sentences. He talked to you for an hour. <laughs> about, about, about not just that one, but he thought about Buddhism as well, but yeah. So that means it's important because you know Master Shin Kung is as a world presence, you know, in the across the world. Talking to him means he's talking to us, talking to everyone, right? Uh, he also has a few encounters like that, but I forgot. Um, they only talk to him because he he has that presence throughout the world. We all hear him, and he spread it according to the wishes of the people we encounter. So back to the point. You're right. Um, Master Ching Kong asked his, to, his own teacher, Mr. Li, Li Bing Lan Lao Jisu. He asked his teacher, is it true that all these, um, like, like what you say, Melinda, founders of the religion, 
they are all coming from as a they are you know behind the fact behind the stage they are actually bodhisattvas you know from the from the pure lands from other Buddha lands. The teacher only gave him a very smart response. 事实上讲得通,理上没证据 So the, I mean, I mean, 理上, 理上讲得通,事实上没证据 Theoretically, you're correct You know, Bodhisattva has a vow to help all beings Especially like Guan Yin, he has the uh, That means the, um, the, the, one of the chapters in one of the sutras The, the, the sutra where he, he, he Bodhisattva Guan Yin, uh, make a vow of uh, appear as whoever uh, appear in the form of whoever wishes for it. If I wishes for a teacher to teach me, he will appear as a teacher. If I wishes for a Buddha to teach me, appear as a Buddha. If I wishes for a woman to teach me, you'll be a woman. If I wishes uh, in the form of a children to teach me, you will become a children. So whatever you wish for, ask and ye shall receive, basically. Look at that in the, in the Bible. Same person, man, same person. Ask and ye shall receive. Okay? Basically, that's what Guanyin Pusa vow is in uh, in the sutra. One of the sutra. Either the, the number one or number two. The um, Hua Yan Jing or Fa Hua Jing, I forgot. Either the Flower Adornment Sutra or the um, uh, Daim uh, Lotus Sutra. Uh, one of them. Miao Fa Lian Hua Jing or Hua Yan Jing. Flower Adornment Sutra or, 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 or Lotus Sutra. Either one. It has to be two. these two. So that means Guan Yin represents all the, you know, all the Bodhisattva has all the qualities of every other Bodhisattva. That's how e equality is achieved. Okay. Problem is when you put on the show, right, you can't just have one person become all knowing, all understanding. It becomes very flat, very plain. Okay. So you know everything, he know everything. There's no, there's nothing for us. To see the sentient beings who has not attained equality, we have differentiation. He will show who's higher, who's lower, right? He will show Buddha's higher, I'm second, he's number three. So Bodhisattva Kuan Yin will show, emphasize the aspect of compassion. I'm just telling you how it works, you know, how, how, the, how the show works, all right, in Buddha, Buddha Dharma. And then Bodhisattva Manjustri, which is representing wisdom. They just focus on one aspect so that we can have a better association because that's how we work right in between them they all have the same exact quality each other they all have the exactly the same quality Bodhisattva Guan Yin has the wisdom of Manjushri um, the huge vow of Bodhisattva Pu Xian which is the universal verdi they also have the um, all other qualities yeah Di Zhang the huge vow of Bodhisattva Siddhikarpa who helped all the sentient beings out of hell before he become Buddha, that means he will not become Buddha until everyone is stopping, stop, uh, you know, creating this bad karma, <laughs> which is almost impossible. Um, but that's how big his vow is. And then, Bodhisattva of great action, which is Bodhisattva Universal Worthy. His quality is Pusian Pusa. You know, the ten vows of Bodhisattva Universal Worthy is the ten. Great action, Pu Xian Shi Yuan, right? And this Bodhisattva uh, Pu Xian has a ten action, uh, uh, ten great action. This action puts step by step. How do you become Buddha? You know, first you need to respect all sentient beings as Buddha. They are all having a Buddha nature. Number one, you always respect them. No matter they are good guys, bad guys, no matter they are Hitler or they are Mother Teresa, they all have Buddha nature. You respect their fact. Number two, you only praise the good person. See, it's wise. You only praise those persons who act in accordance to the true nature. That means kind, good deeds, you only praise them. The bad deeds, according to the example shown by the uh, one of the uh, Bodhisattva who appeared as a kid. You know, he went across the country. Sorry, I jumped a big loop here. I'll go back in the circle. I'm just excited to share that. And then um, uh, that a Bodhisattva who appears as a kid, San Chai Tongzi, okay, uh, went across the countries in India and start from Manjushri, Bodhisattva Manjushri as his teacher. He teach him, say, you want to be Buddha? Go across the country, learn from all the people, from all walks of life, all kinds of existence they live in. 
they are all your teachers. So they all he went one to one, and he practiced the ten, you know, great actions laid down by Bodhisattva Universal Worthy. Basically, teaching them if you do all this, you become Buddha. Of course, he went and went and went and went. He went to three of the people. Yeah, he went to fifty-two person in his journey, and big, went a big circle. End up with his own teacher, I think, or Bu Xian. I think it's Bu Xian. Yeah, end up with this Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Universal Worthy. So my whole point of saying is. Among his journey, all these are good people doing honest stuff. But there are three person who engage in either killing, prostitution, and stealing. I think Sa Tao Ying, Sa Ying Tao. Is it? Well, the three poisons, right? The hatred, which is the killing, the lust, greed, which is prostitution, and ignorance. You know, yeah. So these three persons engaging in th these three kinds of professions, and he only respect them, give them a bow, but he never say anything about praising them. He always praise the other fifty, forty nine person, praise them for their qualities. You know, people who do a good job in carpenting, do a good job in their profession. He praise them. You know, for 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 putting this effort, but he never praise these three person. He only give them a very deep bow and then went away. So this is how you do it. When you saw something not good, against the true nature, against what is good, against kindness, <coughs> you do not say anything. <coughs> Ignore it. Move on. That's how you become Buddha. If you put it in your heart and say, oh, "I want to do this, I want to do that," then sayonara. You can never be one because you always get bogged down in this. Of course, you have wisdom. You know, cause and effect. You can help them to. Move on, but that's another matter. You, as a learner, you need to understand what is priority. You need to get to the other side. Help yourself first. Also help other people along the way, but prioritize on helping yourself in a way of uh, getting yourself out of the mud. Only then you can big, make a big vow. So going back to the point of you know all the founders of religion coming from same source, like bodhisattvas of the Buddha uh, teaching. They are, in fact, compatible with the teaching of Buddhism. Um, but in terms of history, like you say, which is Shi, you know what actually happens. There's no proof, All right? Beyond that, beyond this, this, they all have the same view. They all shares the same sort of kind of vision in a way of the way they deliver it. You know, their the quotes are quite similar. Especially those people with <clears throat> far-reaching sight, you know, their 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 vision is huge. Like Christian, like Jesus, like Buddha, like Socrates as well. They all have that converging point. They have their difference. They have their converging point, and they always never leave that few principles behind. Compassion, wisdom, you know, just the way they say it is different. And that's how Master Ching Kong built his multi-faith initiatives. He focused on the similarities while understand and respect the differences. Right? It's not saying that he abandoned the Buddha Dharma and don't do anything. He still understand that. You know, there are ways of delivering is different. But they all come out from the same place. To educate, to purify, to improve the status of the society. That's the goal. Of course, they will be perverted and twisted in along the way by peoples who do not understand teaching or take it at a face value, who use it in their ulterior motive, which is blinded by hatred, ignorance, and stuff, greed. But you know, it does not defeat the fact that this is the the intention of the founder, and it's up to us to continue this spirit. And to continue this spirit, we need to understand why. Yeah, you can't just, yeah. You know. But if you have the capability to help, we need to know that. If we don't, um, do our best to be a good example. Philosophy is very important in terms of cultivating that kind of spirit of inquisition, spirit of inquiring, 
this is how the whole founders did, right? They they see something wrong in the world and they're trying to find, you know, how do we solve it? You know, Buddha sees the problem of these four sides of life, you know, death, illness. He went very fundamental, really deep, and he I'm trying to solve it. Something that the Hinduism could not solve because they only went to the realm of highest heavens, but they still can't escape life and death. That's what makes Buddhism special. Despite similarities, the depth that Buddhas achieve is unsurpassed. Hence, he is the sage among the sages. He is praised among the other heavens, high heavens. In this way, the other religions are mostly focused on... I'm just trying to put two, 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 two questions in one go, right? Uh, and the other religions, they are all very focusing on heavens because they they also have have that cultivation, meditation, but they haven't reached that level of, you know, surpassing life and death. Even Bodhisattva who appears in that religion, they can't go too much in detail because perhaps that's the level of the student they want to teach. You know, if they go too much, it might be too much. It just depends on the circumstances. That's only among us as Buddhists to hear, of course. When other people, when we talk to other people, we don't say that. We just say that, you know, this is what we, sim that's what I'm saying, Master Chinko, focus on the similarities. Does not mean that there is no differences, doesn't mean we should ignore the differences, but we should not use the differences as a point of no engagement. It's supposed to be where we can talk in the similarities. And then when you do a good job showing yourself as a good cultivator, that means you follow the teachings, you actually be a compassionate and wise person, they will start asking you, how do you do this? What did Buddha teach? That's when you show them the good stuff. All right? There's also good stuff in our religion, but then you show them the good stuff that only Buddha has. Uh, okay, so go back to your second questions, the more practical one. Philosophy on students. I would always, always, always encourage thinking of philosophy. It's... But there's one thing I need to clarify um, from what I learned from uh, the Chinese you know, teachers, as in, you know, those masters, Mr. Nan Huai Jing, right? Master Ching Kong as well. Chinese culture, right, do not use the word philosophy. It does not mean there is no philosophy. It's just they do not, unlike Western culture, which likes to classify it, which is special. This is how science works. They classify it. This is why science works well in but Chinese culture do not classify so clearly. They put everything together. You can see from the Chinese medicine, you understand that. The qi from your your stomach has problem, look at your leg. Okay, I'm going to press that note on that leg and then your stomach will get better gradually. Depends on the condition, of course. So that's how Chinese works. Uh, the Not just Chinese, the Eastern philosophy works, but the core of it is in China back then. And... Um, <clears throat> And while to answer your questions, doesn't matter west or east, I still think philosophy thinking is important. However, you say that the downfall of it is lacking of philosophy. It is partially. Most important thing, right, even there is no philosophy, is just family education. That's just the basic teaching on how to be a, you know, how to show you how to, good parents, good parenting. You know, good example, how to treat people kindly, not bully people. You know, you know, um, and 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 how parents should engage with the teacher when teacher points out their students, their own children's wrongdoing in school. More and more, I hear the parents blindly defending their children's action. Doesn't matter, their children's actually at fault or not. You know, blindly defending is bad because you're teaching the children there's no consequences on your action. You can do whatever you want. Mama and Papa will always be your backstone. And even worse if that Mama and Papa is one of the senators or congressmen or one of the powerful uh, relatives of the sheriffs in the town. doesn't matter what country it is. If you have relationship with the powerful authority people or rich, rich people, wealthy, influential people, this will amplify that kind of you know, recklessness, the, the lack of consequences. This is why students are harder to teach generally in the West, because of the lack of consequential teaching. Not saying that there is no. So philosophy, if used in that effect, used in the effect of more human, like how to conduct yourself properly, then I would say philosophy really has that pivotal, pivot, 
pivotal, like crucial pivot on school education, on behavior, behaviorials, um, improvements of the students. If philosophy is only treated like a, which is what I would say the mainstream philosophy is treated, something like, like irrelevant to your life, something far removed, treating it like a, another subject in science. You just study, 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 go into university and not you actually using. I'm, I'm pretty sure they still understand the need to use philosophy in daily life, but the emphasis is academic, not applicable philosophy. Not like, you know, harnessing, you know, educational system to build up a bright mind that can actually influence the whole generation. That's, that's something we do not see anymore. Back then, there were people who do that because they actually practice what they say or they try to practice what they say and point out, you know, this is what happened when my experiment of this philosophy. Ultimately, philosophy is also based on thinking and thinking can only do so much. I, I would argue that it's way important to have good thinking, but more important is start from character building in family. That's more pressing than whether we should reinstate philosophy or not. If philosophy is helping, say, you know, taking out those parts that actually make students understand cause and effect in their own way. I'm not saying that we should use the word karma straight away, but I'm pretty sure everyone knows karma right at this stage. Thanks to the 80s, like in the movements, I think the West would take a lot from India and China. Um, but but to make it into a really serious mainstream, you know, day-to-day -day thought, I think it has to be on parents than teachers. School system can only do so much. When you, when your children reach the doorsteps of their home, whatever they learn at the school, is either being thrown away or reinforced. And the pivot person who make that happen is their parents. The parents will either enforce, reinforce what the school has taught or make them forget everything about the school, especially in the most formative year, first three years. All right? They are not going to school yet. They are building that character. And that is influenced, highly receptive to parents. And then the, school, the siblings and the relatives that visit them. And then this, when they go to school, they already have a certain understanding. All they do there is they're getting either stronger or weaker. And they go home, which they also spend a lot of time with, is where you are going to echo what the Lao Tzu, the teacher is saying, or you're going to make them forget what the teacher is saying. All right. And that is very important. So short answer, not really. You, you are right. We should have philosophy teaching, but um, just in my opinion, I don't think that's the factor of the downfalls of the student behavior. I assume what you mean by downfall is the students getting harder and harder to teach and uh, in all these negative actions done by the kids, uh, you know, shootings and all that. Of course, that's an extreme one, bullying, day-to-day -day stuff. Um, yeah, also it has to do with philosophy of, you know, the missed use of philosophy, misuse of one of those social theories, like Darwinism, you know, Survival of the fetus. That's a very, very, how to say, narrow interpretation. You know, strong, survive, weak, perish. That's not how it works. All right. If it's how it works, we shouldn't have this system of protect the minority or anything. You become one of those terrible, 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 I don't know, like back in the days, you know, you'd be enslaved. You become, continue that kind of practice. You know, if you because you can't fight back, right? You you become my slave. You become my servant. It shouldn't be like that, right? It's not how what this what your country is built on. It's not what our so called free world is fighting for. That's not what we want to be, and that's what we're trying to fight against. There's some some country that doing that, but I, without going to, to that spectrum, back to the more human stuff, the student is. Um, practicing this kind of bullying and behavior because it was either enforced by it, by that kind of mindset as well. And the mindset is practiced by the society. 
and and they think it's all right to just bully, and you know, no consequences. And the parents are enforcing it. If they do that, it's bad. Sometimes the parents are too busy to notice. They don't notice that children are doing the things like that. So it's not an easy question to answer.、Um, I can only tell you that this is only one piece of puzzle that is quite important if used properly. All right,、uh, because philosophy all ultimately teach about why is the thing as is, and people with that mindset will not resort to senseless action like shooting your classmates or killing or、um, or you know. Or that kind of, you know, more abrasive actions. They will be more vocal. Of course, they can be dangerous in the different way, right? They can rally up a lot of people. But, but I would prefer to have that kind of society, like you say, with people with people have more insightful philosophical mind that than someone who's just having to live with a senseless existence. You know, eat, sleep. Play game, wake up, go to school, ha ha ha, shallow laughs, and then nothing learned at all. You know, skip the schools,、um, make fun with friends on other people because he looks different from them. You know, the body weight, you know, ger-、uh, nerd, and they use all the funny jokes in everything, sexual jokes and stuff like that for the cheap laughs. It's good to have silly laughs. It's good, but At the expense of other people and repetitively, because and then enforced by your student around you, it's just crap. This is not how a country grow. No matter how powerful the military, the the society, the wealth is, those things are bubble. Because there's no foundation to build on. If the foundation of your society is built on this kind of mindset, might as well as it's extinction. It's leading to extinction, and there's no other way around it. Cause and effect, right? There's no people who really want to build. They all just want to, you know, mess around. I'm a bit strong on this, but pretty much, yeah, yeah. Thanks for po- pointing out this one. Yeah, it's it's very important. And speaking of that, look at this this sentence. See other commendable capabilities yet withholding it from praise and recognition, opting instead to slander them. Yep, there we go. All right. So that competitiveness. You know that mindset of competition is in is it's it's a double edged sword. It cannot be used like that. It has to be used in a way of healthy way, like you encouraging them to be stronger so that you can be stronger. That's how it should work. That means wisdom, all right? Like we always have the mentality of comparison. There's nothing we can't escape from that. Like even Buddha have to use comparison to help you to understand where we are. Like you know, if you have, you know, this lifespan, look at that ten lifespan, and then explain that. Or you have other heart, and then you have Buddha Sattva, you have Buddha. But he never say that. Or you stay where you are. You know, you stay where you are. I'm not gonna、uh, let you become me. He never do that. He always want you to become me, become Buddha, become me as in what I represent. So, in a way, so so how competition properly works. Is it has not. It must serve the society. It must serve the the general society. It has to benefit overall. If competition is works, becoming a very cutthroat, as in, are you going to step on you like a Darwinism kind of mindset, which is not what we want to have. Like it becomes, you know, very marginal imp- improvements to the overall society. It's only just two of you having dramas. Because one person is trying to stifle other person's growth, that kind of competition is zero sum game in a way. You try to destroy one another. You now this is what actually happens. Jealousies driven it. You know sometimes it's you know your position. You know you don't want to be taken down. If the so called competition that we promote is that person has to has grown stronger, now I must work my way to that level. And then, still, you know, praising what their strength is, like a healthy competition. You know, I need to keep my games up so that I can keep up with this person. And then, and this is done in a proper way. Then you will encourage that sector to open up, right? That's why it's double-edged sword. 
but I still prone towards what Master Ching Kong has said. That kind of competition we usually associate with is the competition where you, the cutthroat competition, you, you make people fall, you cut off people's path to survive, you make them unable to grow. This is the kind of competition here. Other people are better than you. Oh no, you threaten my position. I'm going to make sure that you never get out of this unit. Never known of this unit because you threatened me. So it's all very petty. Of course, it's not easy when you have like, wait, uh, I might have the lost $2 million per year kind of a income. That kind of mindset, right? But what I'm trying to get is, Master Shinko say that competition will lead to Jing Zhen, right? Competition will lead to conflict, right? And then conflict will lead to war. Jing Zhen, Dou Zhen, Zhan Zhen. Competition escalates to conflict. Conflict between two persons, two companies, two, two sectors, two societies, and then becomes two nations. Or many nations that align with that. That's how it works. And the war of 21st century, as you can obviously see, everyone used the word, the N-word. Not what you guys hear, the nuclear, the nuclear. <coughs> and, and there's a MAD, mutually assured destruction. It's another topic Master Ching Kong fervently trying to say. This is something we need to really worry about, guys. We're way too relaxed on this. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, there's no other way we can avoid it. We already have this invention in our country's arsenal. What can we do? So we can only recognize the dangers of it. So what I'm trying to get back here is, when you saw someone's doing well, we always need to understand why they do well. You know, if you happen to be on the rivalry side, healthy rivalry means you understand why they well. You respect that. And then you grow yourself properly, honestly, to that level. The healthy rivalry eventually will help to create an ecosystem where everyone's very, you know, where it wants to do something, where everyone can, you open up the door where everyone can jump in and, you know, add their ideas on top and making a wonderful collaboration. You know, so that's the kind of rivalry we should have uh, in a healthy economy or healthy society. You know, maybe the culture of rivalry as well in the sense like, hey man, this, this culture, uh, maybe UK and US, you know, healthy rivalry. You know, we eat biscuits, you eat cookies. It's the same thing. You know, my French... Those are funny stuff. But um, like also in like Japan and China, maybe my ramen is better than your ramen. Oh my God. Those, those are healthy rivalries. Or creating better products. You know, without sabotaging, without all this. Maybe you can understand how they work. like, But not doing underhanded tactics. That will maintain your longevity of your life. And your... um. Because when you look at history, right? The most exciting part is when there's two genius born at the same time on the two opposing camps. Three kingdoms, Zhuge Liang. And then, you know, the Zhuge Liang from the Shu kingdom. The three kingdoms is when the Han Dynasty start to disintegrate. In the name of Han Dynasty, there are three warlords happening. You know, the Shu camp is the one that trying to promote the authenticity of the Han, the the the, the incumbent um, house that nominally rules China but no longer actually rules China, de facto. The other one is Wei, which is just Cao Cao, which is famous if people play the games or heard of the stories, who is actual warlord who holds the central seat, has a lot of armies, they are powerful, but they lose their legitimacy in the sense of you know the Shu, because Shu actually has a blood lineage to the Han kingdom. My whole point of saying that is two person like Zhuge Liang, Mr. Zhu and Mr. Sima Yi, they were like, they were like rivals. Of course, it has gone so many years of generations of stories of them. There are many versions, but their rivalry is always interesting to see. You know, the way they, they use wisdom, they use their wit to out battle each other, not just, not just blind, you know, violence and warfare, they actually use a lot of systems and understanding, you know, they, they build up, you know, the system where, uh, you know, they provide logistics, the armies is also the farmers, Tun Tian Zhi, 
All these things are very interesting to read as a worldly person, for me especially. Those are not healthy worry, unfortunately, because they have a very toxic, their kingdoms literally fighting for the one seat, right? So it won't be a healthy worry. But between them, I'm pretty sure they are not like, they're, all, they're both like well-learned people. They have Confucius teaching, they have teaching of, you know, those things, but they call up in this era where no one is able to solve the problem by words. They have to use swords, they have to kill each other. So for him, he's like, but there's also that gentleman agreement between them. There are many stories between them. Um, that, uh, you know, if, if I'm not fighting a war, I'll probably be, you know, your friends. Maybe battle in the court, but that's it. In the court of, of you know, bureaucratic court, not, not sword by sword. So stuff like that, you know. So here, to see other commendables capability, yeah, even back then when they're in the opposite camp, they, they always praised each other. If i not on the opposite side, we will be best friend. That's how it works. World War II as well, General Patton from US or Eisenhower, I don't know, those gen genius, great figures. They also have respect for Rommel from German camp. You know, the, uh, the, I think it's German, German camp, the, one of the greatest general, Rommel. Um... And also the rivalry against Soviet Union, the um, Zukov, I think Marshal Zukov of the Soviet Union. You know, those are talented people, all right? Regardless of the politics, all right? If you see someone's uh, commendable, they have that skill, they've proven themselves. You should always encourage them to grow. Of course, it depends on which camp you're in. Of course, there's unfortunate side of human history is you might be in a different camp, but we need to respect a talented person, no matter who they are, where they are, whether they're in the opposite camp or not. It can be applicable in current politics, where everyone just slander each other for the name, just because you have a different flags. That is not healthy, right? You can you can be on the opposite camp, but you can appreciate their talent, appreciate their dedication. That's how you build a good system where everyone's trying to do the best for the country. For their own bloody parties. Sometimes they're not even thinking about their own parties. They only they only think about their own office, which is very sad, because office only four years. Everyone's gone, and who's left? Another person using the same bloody mentalities. Sorry guys, it just touch. Use the same mentalities, you know, to press other people down. That's not the that's not the kind of world we want to live in, you know. Corporate world, government as well, world nations as well. You know, I don't like this country because their system is bad from us. Just because they're that, you cannot just say the whole thing is bad. You have to say this is good. They're good at managing these issues. All right. They're good at managing their issues. That's how a very healthy, developed person should think. You know, able to, able to understand, appreciate the beauty and the good side. While at the same time, stand your ground on something that is not quite right with your morals and see if we can work it out properly without resorting to violence. That would be a last resort. And here, we're thinking about that as well. Right? So I can, I've thrown a seeds on this, a thought on this one. It can be applied in your own personal career, your country's, you know, politics, your even rivalries between siblings, I don't know, um, or nations. Or, yeah different religions, or maybe um, mostly careers, yeah. Learn to appreciate people is when you know that you are very mature and grown. A person who are really, really understand religion will learn to appreciate other people's religion. People who just slander other people, oh, what did they say about Guan Yin? Yeah, it's in too much evangelists and stuff like that. They, they do not understand their own religion. That's not how it works, mate. All right? If you understand your own religion, you might not agree with the way they understand. You might miss, not understand why they do that. But you always, you know, do it properly, like sincerely. Um, you know, you will, dip, you, will, you, will, you will learn to appreciate the beauty. Like, oh, this is a you know, peaceful religion. They, they do this. Same goes for us. You know, that's how Master Ching Kong unite nine religions in Singapore. First thing, he don't do it for the sake of 
oh, I'm trying to convert you. That's number one. You cannot have that mindset. I'm trying to convert you. That's not how it works. All right. I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't walk and say, become Christian. Oh, he just do whatever he do. Of course, he spread the word as is. And then people will naturally drawn to him as a person. They don't just think about all these big ideas first. They're not. Trust me. In the ground level, you saw that person as a good person. And that person actually do stuff helping people. Unfortunately, some people use that charisma. I, I think in US, there's a lot of these cults as well, right? Jonestown Massacre, stuff like that. They use that sort of charisma to draw people in and then do all this cult stuff. However, unfortunate, there's an unfortunate call, um, similarities, but they are all fake products because ultimately that person is drawn by, you know, either lust or greed or hatred. I don't know. One of those poisons. A person pure of mind, they only do one thing and have one thing in mind. It's trying to help people and then move on. Spread the words of the God or spread the words of Buddha Dharma. It's the same thing. True nature. Your t- purest nature. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> you can have a better existence than this one. Currently, you're only doing this meaningless stuff that just does not help you anywhere. Goes for Muslim religion as well. Islamic religion. How did they start? In the, in the, um, in the Saudi Arabia back then, everyone was very attached to the exterior understanding of the religion. They idol worshipping too much. All right? They don't understand the meaning of worshipping. They just worship for their wealth, their, their, their health, stuff like that. Very shallow. Nothing beyond that. Not saying that it's bad, it's just not enough. And hence, when Muhammad started his teaching, he's also a well-learned person. He went to China as well. He traded, he traded across the world. He went back to, he, he was in China as well. That was like Ming Dynasty or pre-Ming, Marco Polo area, like Mongolian China or something. So he has learned philosophy from across the world. And he went back. <coughs> and uh, I don't know, he meditated under a place near um, Mount Sinai. And then he gained uh, some sort of uh, awareness, uh, message from the God, uh, the Allah, which is the God. So what the whole point they're trying to say is, they're trying to enlighten people as well. This, Islam means enlighten. Right, so when I see that, I was like, "Oh my God, Bodhisattva, you got it, man! So smart." I mean, it's just different words, same thing, mate. It's just, of course, they have to use the word God, God, and stuff like that because it's just how they work. It's the system. But um, set that aside. It's not like it's not really fundamentally different. It's just the way they use it. People personify it as a person instead of a strong idea. So. It's a tradition, but the core is the same. It's to enlighten people. And so how do they call these people who does not understand the teaching? They call them kafir, means someone who does not learn. Islam means someone is learned, you know? So now, now when you understand your religion really well, and you look at other people, you learn to appreciate the synchrony, synchronicities. You also learn to know what goes wrong when people misinterpret this. Because you understand your own religion as well. Like when people idol worshipping Buddha, instead of actually understanding Buddha Dhamma, the difference is huge. But just that we don't do it so in your face kind of thing, like you're idol worshipping, you're bad. We don't do that because it's not wise to point people out like that blindly. Only when some great monk comes out and then they tell you, this is not how Buddhism works, mate. Everyone was like, oh yeah, you're the monk. <clears throat> of course you know how to work. And then... They appear very multiple anger at Buddhism, like especially Zen Buddhism, they look at it in different angles, right? Everything can be enlightenment. Everything can triggers your innate wisdoms. However, you need to practice and cultivate. Some people take longer, some people take one moment. Uh, but everyone work for that one moment of enlightenment. And when they get there, the way they see the world is different. For pure land Buddhism, for us, we already we need to understand why Buddha created the Pure Land? Why Buddha introduced the Pure Land? Why Amitabha is Amitabha? How Shaimini Buddha um, you know, explained to us is important as well because it's meant for us. It's meant for another 10,000 years of his Dharma era, which is us. So it's applicable to us. The way he teaches us is applicable to us. There are also master afterwards that teach us, emphasize on the highest 
importance for us. Sumi name for chanting Amitabha by words. Instead of chanting uh, into other methods of practicing pure land. Because this one, chanting Amitabha by words, is the least path of resistance. No matter what happened in the very end of your life, if you're able to just recite the name, doesn't even need to have image, just the name, that's enough to gain enlightenment. The whole point is to gain enlightenment. Right? So Master Singh can talk to all these religion people and say, we might have our difference, doesn't matter. Deepening our teachings, because those are major good religion, time proven, tested, they are not a cult. Those founders have real spirit of, you know, teaching people and they have proven themselves. So we just learn, 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 deepen it. Their teaching cannot be wrong. It's just our interpretation. Let go of your ego, understanding, twist it. Don't stop twisting it. Stop perverting in our uh, understanding. Read it as, is, as it is. All right. We get it, we get it. We don't get it, don't force our meaning onto it. Same goes with Buddhism. When you learn it, you don't force your meaning into it. You don't understand it, leave it be. You read it again. Read it again. In that essence, Islam is quite close to Buddhism because they also do the same thing. They read again, again, again. Repeat and repeat and repeat. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So what I'm trying to say is, you deepen your religion, Master Nikon say, eventually when we go to whatever we want to go, we'll meet again. And then we'll be asking, why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? And we realize it's the same thing we've been doing all the time. It's just different ways to get to the same place. So, it is. Alright. This is nothing. Master Jing Gong at the nine, age of 92. His breath cannot even match up. He's still tall. At this stage, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Malicious intent. So, I'm bringing mostly the positive, uh, how to say, contrast to this, right? And how important it is for understanding uh, our intent. Um, and to understand our intent, you need to understand cause and effect. And put in your life and understand your society, your surroundings. Uh, at the end, it goes back to us, how we see the life. You know, how we decide our thoughts. Clear your thoughts. Clarify your thoughts first before you move further. Because it's important. It's not force into your own trap. Because thinking itself is a contraption. It's a maze. Like I already mentioned in the eight consciousness. That one is based on the consciousness only school, Wei Shi Lun by Maitreya Buddha. Alright? Or Bodhisattva Maitreya. When he report to Bodhisattva Buddha Shaimani in one of the sutras. Um if I wish I remember the name. But Wei Shi Lun is very important. And it only teaches one thing is it's dry, it's very, you know, technical, scientific. The whole point is trying to tell us our thoughts. Not a single thing is real. Not a single thing is reliable. Right? It's quite contradictory what I'm saying. We need them. We need them to build an understanding concept, what I'm trying to do here as well. But treat it like a boat on a river. It's meant for you to reach to the other side. Nirvana. The whole point of Nirvana means you reach the other side. Nirvana. Right? Destination. Reach the destination. You cannot mistake the boat as your destination. You cannot hug the boat and say, this is where I am. You will sink. Or you will stay where you are and not going anywhere. And you feel like, why am I not enlightened yet? Why am I feeling trapped? Because we are not using the boat as it meant to be. Problem is, how do you see the boat as a boat, not as your destination? You need to learn how to identify your thoughts. It's a tool or a trap. Depends on how you use it. Right. I mean, I'm saying it here. It's very important. All the emotions, all the thinking, all the ideologies, they're important tools to push you towards that end, which is pure land, which is nirvana, which is hua yin fa jie. That one is where you fully realize your faculties. You no longer get trapped by the faculties. To reach there, every single decision you make now is an accumulation of your effort towards or against that direction. 
right? Buddha already mentioned everyone eventually, eventually become Buddha. However, how long is that eventual eventuality? It's it can be kalpas of kalpas, you know, astronomical numbers to be a Buddha. It can be this lifetime, which is within one hundred years. Right, give yourself one hundred years to live. It's a huge difference, mate. Even though you you still become Buddha in the end eventually, but how long is that eventually? Why do we even want to go to Pyongyang? Like I say, this world is like our mind. It actually it bore out of our mind contraptions of all kinds, but no longer none of them is like I say. We dwell a lot in some philosophy stuff, in scientific stuff, medical stuff. It's all intertwined. That's how Eastern philosophy works, Melinda. That's how Eastern philosophy works. They intertwine each other. None is separatable from one another. That's the foundation. This this world that we have is like our mind. It's a lot of intricacies, complexities, layers. You know, outside, inside. They, how and all of them go by duality. They are always out in good, bad, up, down, left, right. All right. Conflicts, you know, can A, can B, male, female, you know. But this is how the world works. Without the existence of it, bores out of the ignorance. You know, 一念无名而有，哦，这个世界。So what we're trying to learn here is to untangle it a little bit, loosen it a little bit. Eventually, get to the point where we are, um. Strengthened our awareness when we need it. Now we may not know when we need it. Now we may not be aware. We're just passively absorbing it. You know, it's fine. But always have that at your back. Put it in the back burner. Have it ready any time. You know, just like you guarding against.、Uh, I don't know, guarding against flood or intruders in your home. You always keep yourself a lot. Like any time, any place, when you need it, you pull it out. And how much you can pull out depends on how much you absorb, how much you learn, absorb, how much you use. You know how common you use it. Hey,、like、you say it one time, you use it one time. You 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 do it one time, you use it one time. Those teachings. When you face this situation, like anger, ha- hatred, <clears throat> how do you manage yourself? Well, yeah. You know, every time it comes up, how how well, how far, how close are you in preventing it? If you already done the transgression or the unhol and unholy th-、um, unhealthy thoughts or unwholesome thoughts, how close are you from t- detecting that it is it is unwholesome thoughts? It is it is not good thoughts. Those things you can put it in perspective so that you can have a measurement. Last time I was. This close to release my tempo, right? To throw a fit. This time I'm very easy now. I don't feel that close. Or this time I only throw my anger on my face. I don't say anything. Last time I yell all the words, swear words and stuff. This time I only have the facial expression. I need to work harder. Next time, I might not show it in my face, but in my heart, it's still a lot. This is how it works for us, most of us, anyway. Sometimes it might regress, like oh, I'm really caught up in the moment, and I just blah blah blah, and then I realize, oh shoot, I shouldn't do that.、Hmm. So manage it. All we do now is managing it. Our whole point of Chinese metaphor is the minimum amount is to able to res res. Re- Not repress, re- control it, put it under the hood, so that it does not explode everywhere. It was under the hood, under control. That state of under control is public, shown to everyone. When you can chant Amitabha without, without chanting, without thinking about chanting, without setting a time frame, I want to chant Amitabha. You just have Amitabha coming out when you sleep, when you when you stand up, <coughs> when you cough. No matter what you do, it comes out. You just can't help it, right? That, let me tell you a story. There's a great, there's an old grandmother, an old 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 lady. 
she does not know how to, you know, maybe she's not educated stuff it, but she went to a monk and said, what should I do? You know, right now I don't have anything else to do. The monk teach the old lady, you chant Amitofo. And the old lady chant, 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 chant. And she's very sincere, she's very honest. She do every day as the teacher instructed. Eventually he went to a level where his stomach keeps chanting Amitofo without her trying. She's like, my stomach, I keep, I keep, I keep tugging my stomach and say, stop. But I can't sleep. My whole body is chanting Amitofo. My stomach is chanting Amitofo. My ear is chanting Amitofo. I can't sleep, Master. And Master say, congratulations. You don't need to sleep anymore. If you have reached that level, your energy, you don't need the energy from sleep because you have, you're full of energy. And then the, 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 the lady does not even know what's happening. But she just earnestly chant Amitofo. Right? She doesn't even know all this. She chant Amitofo. <clears throat> but she's very pure, sincere. No, none, none, of, none of this contraptions. She's not... The good thing is she does not need to use too much of it because there's no need. The condition is perfect. She does not has access to that literacy that creates complexities. Of course, this is a different condition. We can't unlearn. It's a hard thing. Master Ching Kung's teachers say, I try to learn those, you know, grandmother, grandfathers that, you know, do not know how to, they are illiterate. They are not having high level educations. But all of them, most of them, when they were, didn't have good conditions, they met monk or lay Buddhist who teach them Amitofo chanting. They Almost all of them made it. They were able to be so intensely focusing on it without even trying. They just do it naturally with their day-to-day -day routine. Almost all of them go to Pure Land. So this grandmother is also the same. She has that. So she's, the, the monk said, congratulations, you don't need to sleep anymore. You already have the ability to chant without trying to. And that is also, that is also pre, that is pre-enlightenment, by the way. Without the Amitabha's 40, 48 vows. This one is, this is what we meant by putting your affliction under the hood. Xiang Fu Fan now. Si Tou Ya Chao. Master Wu Xing always used this analogy. Rock pressing the grass. What does it mean? What is grass? Right? What does grass mean? What is rock? What is grass? Can anyone explain? Can anyone um, tell me? <coughs> what is affliction? Grass or rock? Yeah, what is rock? That's right. That's it. It's not ching. It's not clearing. So grass <coughs> is affliction. Yes. And rock is unmeetable. Yes. That's the level we need to achieve. So, but rock is heavy. Yep. It has to be dense. Right? It cannot be a piece of feather. You can't do anything. It has to be dense. All right? Of course, we don't think too much into it. When he say that, all he's trying to say is your affliction is under control. Literally. That means when you have those kind of, you know, intent, whether slight, very slight intent, there are levels of intent, they are very obvious. Oh, yeah. so you're able to grass is, grass is many leaves of grass or yeah, or yeah, whatever. So affliction. That's okay, how got, got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Good example. Yeah, Mera Wuxing, he knows. Our affliction is like grass. It grows, it grows, it grows. All we need to do right now to overcome this problem with the help of Amitabha's 48 vow, that's why it's so important to learn this, is like our grandma did. Eventually, you're able to use it to suppress. Not uprooting it, that would be good, but it's hard for us. But this lifetime is very hard. All right. Realistically, we we can achieve that level of su suppressing the thoughts. If we can do that, we will be able to invite Amitofo into our heart. Amitofo never have a problem going to your heart. It's our problem opening into it, opening up to him.
It's so never the problem of giver. It's always the receiver. We can't receive it because we block our own signal. His signal is here already. You don't need to wait. He's already here. It's just your pro- our problem. Are we ready to let go or not? You know, one day you say, okay, let's go to Pure Land. Oh, wait, I need to play my game. Oh, wait, I haven't finished my Tyson Kain pen. Oh, I haven't finished this. No. You go. And you need to have that level of go. That, that one moment. You cannot allow yourself a second thought. Because Buddha never forced people. He will not force you. If you think about, oh, my husband. Oh, my house. He's like, bye. What well, it means about maybe next time. Maybe the next time is next life or this le- this life is already hard to say. So very, very, very important. Hence, when you can do that in your day-to-day passive thought, then you can do that in the most important time. This is why the soldiers practice conditioning every day so that their body can react in times of emergency. Split second will call, mean death or life. So they all have to practice every day, arduously train. So does our mind. Our brain also has to practice this one so that we can immediately pull out Amitofo instead of pull out random thoughts that we have used. Something that I regret a lot, but um, still unable to do it properly. It's because you haven't let it, haven't let it go. Pretty sure that that's what happened to uh, us in the past life as well. We haven't let go. So <clears throat> I heard is uh, my foster mom was telling me about uh, a lady that went to Vietnam, and I guess she. I don't know. Uh, she didn't wake up for three days. And she, when she woke up, she goes, I saw, I think, Kwan Sing Pusa and Ami Tofu. And then she described them to, to the people. But she looked peaceful, peaceful and they thought that she passed away. She woke up three days later. So, my question is, how do you know, when you sleep like that, how do you know the one that you see is truly Amitofo or Guansing Pusa when you pass away? Because you're on that topic of going peacefully. Um, depends on what you commit when you're conscious. If I commit to go to Pure Land and I commit to be a student of Amitabha Buddha, when I, in my very last moment of my life or in dreams, and I dream someone other than Amitabha Buddha, like Shayamuni Buddha, that means it has a chances of, because Shayamuni Buddha himself will not confuse you like that. He will say, if you focus on Amitofo, he will appear as Amitofo. Or the Amitofo will appear to you instead of him. He will not do that to you. He will confuse you. So the only reason for Sa'amimira to appear to you when you already committed to Amitofo is the Mara, the Demon King, trying to distract you from leaving these six realms. So you are ver- asking a very crucial question here. How do we know? Ask ourselves every day, what are we committing to? If I'm like committing to, say, Maitreya Buddha, so that I can be his student in the in the third level heaven, Tien, Tushita heaven, in the court, not out of court, guys. Out of court is all parties, beautiful man, beautiful woman, and then they boom, boom, boom. But in the court is where the actual Buddha, uh, Bodhisattva is. So a lot of people get attracted by people outside. They forgot to go inside. That's the that's why it's harder than pure land. But for the sake of understanding, whoever you're committing to is the person who will appear as they are. There's a rules in the 
heavens or in the six realms. They cannot appear as a person you're committed to. Have faith in these rules. The only issue is, are you committed to that person or not? So I'm committed to Amitofo. The only apparition, I, the only appearance in my dream or my last death, deathbed can only be Amitabha Buddha. Or, in, or if I say the Sansan, okay, the Amitabha Buddha, Bodhisattva, Guan Yin, and the Dai Siji, you know, the um, thus arrived, you know, the great arrival, Bodhisattva. You know. But my, my, for the interest of focusing, it can only be Amitabha Buddha. It's easier to recognize. White color, porcelain, appearance. That's it. That's my case. Um, for your case as well, it can be different. It can be different colors as well. It can be, um, you know, yellow color, golden color. For me, it's white color. All right. Once we fix on that one image, Master Shingo say that, all right? Focus on that image for the rest of your life. All right. Every time you think of Amitabha 4, you understand this is the image of Amitabha 4. Don't need to necessarily image, you visualize clearly. You just need to say, I'm committed to Amitabha Buddha, and this is what, this is this is the only apparition that I will follow. The rest are not the real Buddha themselves, because they have no business to be there at the time, at the very time when you are confused, right? If Buddha can already help you to pure land, like I already mentioned many times, we wouldn't be here talking about this. We'll be there already. We'll be learning something much more powerful, much more in depth. Right now we can't because we can't let it go. That means our willingness, agency of change depends on us, not Buddha. Buddha never changed their vow. So hence, the only reason we will be misled in our time of need is because we are not committed clearly to the Buddha that we have already selected to follow. All right? If I'm going to follow Sayyamuni Buddha, next life as a monk, right? Everyone has different vow, okay? Obviously, I prefer everyone can go to Pure Land, it's easier. But if they are vowed to be a monk, like in Fogon Shan, there's a lot of people who want to be a monk again. So they only imagine one Buddha, which is Sayyamuni Buddha. And they, they imagine clearly what kind of form the Sayyamuni Buddha takes. At the end of their life, hopefully, they will not be misled. They can only be one image they have. This is how it works. They cannot imitate anyone that you committed to. The Mara King cannot do that. There's a rule. All right? This is a rule, iron rule. No one can trespass. This is not how it works. All right? That's just law. So, I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Whatever you committed to. Whoever you committed to. So, what, what you? are you committed to? <laughs> What form? Uh, I mean, well, but I okay. didn't know the color yet because oh. it, what you just told me is a interesting concept. I was like, oh, I have to think about it, but I do believe in Amitabha and Guan Xing. Yep. Um, but I never actually thought about what if I. Tomorrow, if I die, what would it look like? I never thought about that. That's your homework. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <What> about anti <clears throat> it's up to your preference. It doesn't matter. Buddha does not like. Oh, I like this color. You cannot make me change. They don't have. They have no ego. It's up to you. Well, <clears throat> I'm asking anti yunsa Like, if you pass away tomorrow, what would I mean, yep. Tofu looks like to you. Dylan a white robe, right? Gold robe. Okay. Everything gold, yeah. And then what about their hair? No hair? This one? Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. I like that one. Either way, the you just you just fix on one image. That's the whole point. Like, just get one image that you like, 
that you you can use every day and see every day and then fix on it it's easier for us that's the whole point of army tofu as well like helping us to fixate on something because we always love to fixate on something so might as well give us something to fixate on yeah as long as army tofu i think it should be fine the color is is is, is fine and like they wouldn't appear as a different color army tofu i think it's just for the sake of safety you just fix on one color and uh, easier for us to remember because otherwise it would be confused um but i i'm pretty sure like at the at the bottom line is it has to be amitabha buddha and um you just know anyway does that Probably inspire you if, if it's simplified like that i think it would be easier white with blue background with yeah. skies okay welcome with to skies. my problem yeah it's easier for us to understand but um hey no no hard and fast rules remember buddha when he appears he will appear in whatever you, color you like he sometimes you appear in like chi chai you know seven colors or it's a color show basically the whole thing is like a light show like you see the concert there's nothing compared to his color show he literally can light up the whole thing it be in a way that you will like and energize and according to the sutra it's just relaxing so as long as it touches you it makes you wanna chant amitofo that's that's more than enough you got the idea man you got the idea as long as the person is amitabha buddha and you recognize that as a amitabha buddha he will appear exactly what you want that's that's his commitment so uh, yeah. our commitment is to remember him don't forget about him because there's a lot of because it's different now you're clear you conscient you're conscious you're clear you know who you are you know who i am you know who manlian zi is you know where you are but when you at your end at the very end of your life all faculties are loosening up it's very hard for us to remember all we can rely on is our muscle memory but we have drill into ourselves when we are conscious it's too late for us to last minute pull out only when you have deep root which means you did that in the past life but fail maybe in in a last 100 lives not 100 continuous life maybe 100 sporadic lives maybe one life you forgot one life you remember one life you forgot again one life you remember and then you have deep root in that sense to pull out from only then you can but you can't rely on this this is literally lot in a way lottery like when the condition comes up or not that some something we cannot measure something we cannot rely on we need to rely on our practice right now that's the only thing you can rely on yeah making the beats is good because it make it enforce your memory this is how this you even because you're making the beats of amitabha right uh image so you kind of know for me i when i when i chant i just look at him and understand his posture every time bow for you just memorize how he stand and then you you focus when you sing by how guang you know the 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 praise they are literally describing him so this this is how i enforce it for myself so you we all have a different way to do it to so keep doing what you're doing all right good work guys um i think we'll end it here we'll excited to hear it next monday about uh, our progress how strong is amitabha in your mind ah oh, i need to work out on that Okay, we'll finish it here. This one will be next week. We have four of them. Oh, I forgot to chime it off for this morning. So let's do 20 times this time. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Just like this one is 2 hours instead of one. Ah, me. Oh, for. Ah, me. Oh, for. Ah, me. Oh, for. Ah, me. Oh, for. Ah, me.
มีมีโอฟอร์ May the merits and virtues adorn the Buddha's pure land, repay the four kinds of kindness above, and relieve the sufferings of those in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this, or bring forth the heart of understanding and compassion, and live the teaching for the rest of this life, then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. Namo Amitabha. Thank you, everyone. Namo Amitabha. Amitabha. Have、Thank、a good、you. morning to you guys. <laughs>